issuance of cards, you can still have your plants until July 1st, but when full repeal goes in, then you can't, cannot have those plants <coughs> against usable marijuana or any products on July 1st if you haven't gotten a card as a provider. And if you haven't gotten a card as a provider, you need to take all of those items to your local law enforcement agency for destruction. I'll move adoption of this section. Okay. We, uh, before the committee, are amendments 148 through 151, which is effectively section new section 23 of the bill. Mr. Chair. Discussion. Uh, Representative Barry. Uh, clarification. You say, uh, Ms. O'Donnell, O'Connell, that um, the people that have a card that was issued here in April would have until way next April in order to, before they have to re-register? Mr. Chairman, Representative Barry, if they were a patient, if right. they are a caregiver, their card would expire on June 30th. Mr. Chair, I just feel that's a little bit too much latitude. I'd like to see that drop down to three months or six months. Mr. Chairman, if I could respond to that, while they have a card, they government and state who either that they're growing it for themselves, or that they've got someone else who's going to do it, and they have to name them. So that a part they have to probably almost all of them interact with the department somewhere in that transition time. I mean, because there's no other way for them to acquire medical marijuana without detailing to the department who's going to provide it. So their diagnosis would not have changed, and so that's not the, not the dilemma here. The dilemma, and because we haven't really changed what the conditions for which you get the card, the dilemma is in how they acquire the marijuana, and so they have to go through the department to do that. So I, I mean, I think we catch them, almost all of them in that system, except for a very small number who are already have a card and are already growing it for themselves. And that, and that would continue for a number of months. But they're a really minor part of the situation. Almost everybody's going to have to go through the department again. Thank you, Representative. Representative Smith, did you have a comment? I did, Mr. Chairman. I also wanted to uh, <coughs> um, bring in discussion again that we had looked at uh, how cards were issued over the past year, and we saw lumps that took place. And, and so this should... Um, over a relatively short period of time take care of, I think we're looking at about a third of the cards. Representative Smith, that is my recollection. Representative mm -hmm. Sands, you brought us that statistical information that came from the department, and mm -hmm. I think there was something on the order of 8,000 cards that will be expiring just under the normal under the expiration of the year term between now and August or September. I, th I think that's generally true from what I understand. Senator Larson. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, I think it would be a real challenge for the department to have to, in a very abrupt fashion, recalculate 30,000 cards and in this we had a long discussion about this in the development of 423 in the beginning that it makes some sense to have it staggered over time. So, and the fact that uh, Representative Sands points out that a lot of this is going to be captured in a pretty quick uh, order. Not only that, the, the growers, the people who produce, are going to be handicapped. The larger growers are going to be limited to a very limited number of people. So, that's going to collapse the production side of this whole formula. So I think that the people who have cards should have the opportunity to at least have some time to transition and find a different provider. Representative Chair, Perry. <laughs> the only thing I do not like about this is I feel that many of the cardholders haven't gotten these cards in kind of not the most ethical way and we're going to let those cardholders continue for another year. That's my concern. But with due respect to Senator Larson, I know exactly where he's coming from for the department to try to reissue 30,000 cards. I understand that. Just like I say, a good share of those cards, though, probably don't really need to have them or shouldn't have them under this new law. So whatever. 
Mr. Chairman, I think that is a dilemma here because the ones you're thinking about, I think, are the 18 to 30 year olds who, if they got a card right now and named themselves as their as their grower, they are, in my assessment, not going to be able to get a new card. And but so they'll age out of here. But it may take them a little while to age out. But I'm more concerned about the impact on the department if we dump all these on them in one fell swoop. Thank you, Representative. Mr. Chairman. We, uh, we almost we also looked on that uh, and took into account when they discontinued the um, the traveling shows that were taking place at the hotels and stuff and it ended sometime in the summer if I remember right so. the summer 2010 mm -hmm. representative Barry if this committee, we're, my intention is to get oh. this bill into shape for everything, but <laughs> the uh, Alaska amendment that's lost somewhere <laughs> on a desk somewhere. Mr. And Chair, perhaps if you want to think about no, I'm just trying offering to find an amendment in the no. morning, we can discuss it. Right now, let's just go this way, Mr. Chair. I'm, okay. I'll be fine. Question. Question being called for amendments. 148 through 151. <coughs> Everybody clear what we're voting on. Mm -hmm. This is the transition schedule. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. House members? Aye. aye. Senate members? Aye. 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 Both houses have adopted. Ms. O'Connell. Mr. Chairman. Amendments 152 through 155 have already been approved as internal reference changes. Um, and so that brings you to amendments 156 and 157, which are the effective dates. Um, and that language is on page 30 of the red bill. Um, everything is effective <coughs> July 1st, except the sections prohibiting advertising, allowing emergency rulemaking, repealing the issuance, the section that allows for issuance of cards, and the amendments related to that, the transition section is effective immediately, as would be the instructions to the code commissioner. Move adoption of those amendments. Thank you, Representative Sands. Discussion of amendments 156 and 157. Question. Question being called for. All those in favor of adding amendments 156 and 157 to the bill indicate by saying aye. House members? Aye. aye. Senate members? Aye. 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 Both bodies adopt. Those amendments are on the bill. Okay, members. Uh, earlier today we punted on a couple of policy decisions. Let's backtrack and try to resolve those at this point. Were there any amendments other members of the committee wish to offer? Representative Sands, I see some numbers. There are amendments, but I believe we can take them up as we go through the, because they address the um, issues we still have unresolved, and I could bring them up in that context, okay. Ms. Mr. Chairman. So shall we just start from the front again? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that well, so let's start with the whereases. Senator Vincent. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't really like whereases except unless I'm sponsoring wolf bills. <laughs> <laughs> How many whereases were in there? <laughs> About three pages. <laughs> I, I just I don't think that I don't think that we need I don't think we need the whereases. So I was just going to suggest that we uh, that we strike that from the House bill, or from the from the bill I guess from our bill. The bill. The bill. Mr. Chairman, one of the reasons why I thought it would be a good idea to have the whereases in there, it, it kind of clearly defines where we stand with the federal law, and uh, I think that's helpful. Makes me feel better. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, my other comment with that would be, though, if we would have those, I think also acknowledging um, the, uh, they're almost the, the purpose, you know, that we're in the original initiative, you know, to provide 
legal protections for persons with debilitating medical conditions who engage in the use of marijuana to alleviate symptoms of a debilitating medical condition. I mean, the reason we're doing it isn't just the whereas is because of the federal law, which we're addressing, but it's because there are people out there for whom medical marijuana is really useful. And, and so while, yes, I agree with these three whereases, I think there are other whereases that are equally important, because if it was only these restrictions, we wouldn't have a bill at all. But because the public has voted to have uh, marijuana available in limited amounts for people who need it, they should either be in here or we shouldn't just do any of them, because we all know it all just goes into the session law anyway and doesn't matter. And that was the point that I, Mr. Chairman, that was the point that I made. In the, in the last whereas, I mean, it's by allowing the limited use of marijuana under the Montana Marijuana Act, the state of Montana does not condone the commission of a criminal violation of the federal control. Yes, we do. <laughs> I, I think we, I, I, um, I, I don't understand. I just don't get it. Mr. Chairman. Senator Larson. I rarely agree with my esteemed colleague to my left here. <laughs> I, did I say left? Anyway, um, I agree. I think the whereas are unnecessary. I think there's a lot of power in the document itself, and I think by putting these whereas we're sort of isolating something. In my mind, it, it, it the document flows just fine for me now without those whereas in it. I mean, marijuana is a is a Class one drug, a status one drug. There's nothing we can do about that. But we're we're doing what the people of Montana ask us to do. So I I agree with Senator Vincent. Mr. Chairman, uh, I move Barry. I move that we just take the whereas is out. If that isn't the motion, I'd like to move that motion. Thank you for the motion, Representative Barry. For the discussion. Question. Question being called for. All those in favor of. Removing the whereas is from the, the bill. Please indicate by saying aye. House members? Aye. Aye. Senate members? Aye. aye. Uh, the whereas is are off the bill. <coughs> Next issue, and if I miss anything, members of the committee or Ms. O'Connell, please jump in. <coughs> we don't need to revisit the advisory committee. That'll just be held, handled by legislative interim child and family services. Mr. Chairman, isn't it on page two this issue of the definition of a debilitating medical condition and the issue of objective proof? I mean, that's the first thing I have marked for yes. severe pain. I think you're right. Members of the committee, this was language that was in the Senate version of 423. This came out of the rules adopted in the state of New Mexico. Uh, it was an attempt on the part of the Senate to raise the bar with respect to uh, the severe chronic pain definition. I mean, the original, the act that's in effect now says severe or chronic pain, and I think it's probably not the severe pain category that's been misused, it's the chronic pain, since it was not required under the existing statute to be severe. So the, I think the policy dilemma, if I can just walk around it a little bit, is uh, how do you address that? Um, that issue is raised by Dr. Guggenheim, which was, uh, you know, with respect to uh, severe chronic pain, there's, you know, that you can have it when it's, uh, you can determine by test, like an x-ray or an MRI, and you can see something, or B, uh, it impacts the patient's ability to follow a normal course of life you know, in terms of uh, uh, 
the fact that it debilitates them and they cannot pursue a normal course of life. Is, would that, I mean, can can we do something in that regard? I'm just going to throw out, an, you know, something for discussion. Mr. Chair, with what the doctor said this morning and with what you just said now, I think if we put that wordage in here in relation to these uh, conditions, I think that would go a long ways to uh, help with our definitions. Mr. Chairman, I mean, I think one of the issues you raise is really critical to remember this changing severe, rather than saying severe or chronic pain, that's severe chronic pain so that it's not, um, I think that addresses part of the problem um, in narrowing the definition of what kind of pain are we talking about. Is it, you know, a couple day event or whatever, but this has to be chronic severe pain. And so that tightens that category. Next, I would go back to, you know, the number of physicians. We've put out of business all of the drive-by clinics and the ability for the industry to hire physicians who just write these for people for whatever imagined or real things that they might think they have. So we really are cranked down to physicians who really haven't been abusing this definition or lack of a definition here, that you have the... 300 and some of the 350 who've never really done 20, and most of them have done way fewer than that. So I'm not sure that that's as much of a problem or will be as much of a problem as it has been in the past. Um, so I don't, you know, I think we can wordsmith some more things in here, but it, it amounts to us kind of trying to practice medicine for those 300 folks who are actually doing a good job out there relative to pain. and. I would expect to see that number drop dramatic, dramatically rela related to pain just because of the other provisions that address the excesses here. So I still, you know, I think that I'm glad to see everybody engage in this issue because we spent a lot of time in the interim trying to look at how do you deal with the issue of pain. And it was quite an education for all of us learning, you know, that 5 to 10 percent of the population do suffer from severe or chronic pain. This is a an emerging field that uh, many of our larger communities are only beginning to address in a professional kind of way, and that it's, that it's very difficult to do objective proof. And so the requiring of tests for that, you know, as much as we would like it to be that way, it doesn't really work. So I think either you leave that whole thing out or you say may include or you add some other language to it, and then I think you just get kind of caught in the, get caught in the weeds. Members of the committee, let, let me offer this. I'm going to, before um, Senators Larson and Vincent and I went to work on 423, I had done some work with respect to borrowing language out of the Americans for Disability Act, and I think I'd like to try to revisit that tonight and then bring it back to the committee in the morning with respect to, you know, some, because it, it would seem if you could have a, a, a legitimate doctor can make a legitimate determination that somebody was not able to, to engage in a normal, a normal healthy lifestyle for whatever reason, that would be somewhat objective, which I think is the goal. <coughs> So let me try to see if I can wordsmith something and bring it back to the committee in the morning. Is, would that be okay? Certainly. And, and Ms. O'Connell, was there anything in any of the other states' language around that? I know we went through it, and I just don't recall. Was there something that addressed kind of S Senator Esmond's uh, concern? Mr. Chairman, Representative Sands, I think some states have tried to deal with it, and I can pull out that paper That'd where I discuss some of the other options. And Mr. Chairman, when, when we were, it, it seemed to me the, the states that we looked at when we ended up lifting that language out from New Mexico, uh, the proof to me that the reason that I was so supportive of it was because they had went through, they had a, a little bit of a spike like mm -hmm. we did after um, the federal, <laughs> some of the federal, um, I guess, I don't know how to phrase it, uh, backing off from from what you know Holder and, and crew were saying but I, I 
1,600 in, out, of a, out of a state's population that's two and a half times Montana, they, they're still kept it at 1,600. So I, it, it just seemed like it was, you know, they'd went through this. They have an advisory council. They've been kicking this around. And that's what it seemed like we, instead of reinventing the wheel, that's why I, I landed there. But I'm, I'm more than willing to, to look at uh, it, some other options because it sounds like uh, maybe we aren't um, cookie cutter to, to New Mexico with, with our board of examiners and whatnot. But I'd, I do, I do agree with what we heard. Pain is relative. I think if you were to ask everybody on here how much pain it is to serve on this committee, <laughs> we would all have different answers. But um, it is relative, and I think it's hard to get our get our heads around. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> I think the next issue I've got highlighted is the degree of kinship issue. Mr. Chair. Barry. Mr. Chair, after giving us some thought and talking to other members of the committee outside of the, the hearing here, maybe we should just drop this in saying that a provider can provide for uh, three people and we just drop the relationship, blood relationship. Representative Smith. Mr. Chairman, I, I think that works okay. We're trying to establish a limited number of people that um, we have out there and involved. So I think that's, uh, I think that's reasonable. Representative Smith, Represent Senator Vincent. I'm just going to say that I would, I would agree with that as well. Um, I would also suggest that we that we put some provisions in that that allows that, that puts a specific cap on the amount of plants for for that provider and allows that to allow a provider to be also have a card um, but that they would be included in that in that three um, so that there would not be an increase with a, with allowing a, a card holder to be a provider as well they would still operate under the 12 plant rule Okay, okay. Senator Vincent, let me try to interpret this then. What you're suggesting is we, a provider could be a provider for up to three registered cardholder patients. Including themselves. Right, so he can, if he is not a patient, if he or she is not a patient, they could provide to three patients and have 12 plants. If the provider is a patient, he would also have three plants, but he would also provide only to two other individuals. Correct. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah. With, with um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we've covered that in our language. I, I think we may have already that a, you cannot if you are a, a care a provider for somebody, you could also you could not also be a patient for one of the people that you are providing for. Representative Smith, in our discussions, you know, did we did we Claire, did we do that already? Within a well, that's the <laughs> I'm going to turn to Sue Miss O'Connell shortly to ask that question. But the concern that was raised in our discussions were, was a question whether under the current law there had, at least there had been some talk about uh, person A being a patient, person B being a patient, and then each being providers to the other person. So effectively under the current statute they can each possess 12 plants each. So the two people could each, as a as a group, possess a total of twenty four. Is that correct? That's that's one of the problems we have out there now. And and uh, just to follow up on Senator Vincent's line of thinking, something else we'd want to take and make sure if we went that route that that unit of three is is a closed system, so that you don't have one of the cardholders out there now being in a relationship with another two people so you have it daisy chained forever 
So that brings my question to Ms. O'Connell. <laughs> Ms. O'Connell, just... where, where in this draft does it say you can't do that? <coughs> or do we need to add some language to that effect? Mr. Chairman, I think if you're going to remove the second degree of kinship language then on page 7 of the Salmon Bill, subsection 3 establishes the limits on the number of patients a provider may assist. On, on page, page 7, seven <laughs> subsection 3. And so I think the changes that you're discussing would probably need to be made there. And I'd like to hear some more discussion on exactly what the changes you would like, how, how you would like those changes to work other than just a, removing the second degree of kinship requirement and allowing up to three patients or another number. Mr. Chairman, couldn't, couldn't that language about the daisy chain be handled by some language sort of like, if a cardholder is also a provider, they may not designate another person as their cardholder, as their provider, so you stop that. I mean, it's a fairly simple piece of language that just says you can't double dip that way. That's the simple way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Sue's a master of words. Didn't get all your words down. Well, so, well something like, if a cardholder is also a provider, the cardholder may not designate another person as, as their, their provider. provider. Correct. Because the other patients in that group Correct. They only designate one Correct. Provider. Correct. So we would have covered that base. Correct. How, however, the concern I'm having is could one of those other cardholders be a provider for another group? That's what I want to make sure doesn't happen. Get the Venn diagram out. I know. It, I when I started looking at it in my mind, I thought, gee, we could be right back to where we are right now with everybody being a provider and a cardholder for everybody else if we're not careful how we, we structure this. And that's one of the problems because that adds a lot of product into the whole supply chain. But I do think Senator Vincent's point is well taken because you could certainly have a person that is uh, a cardholder themselves that knows how to grow product and use it, and that would be uh, you know somebody that would be able to help somebody else that doesn't know how to do it. If we can figure out a way to structure it so it doesn't create a daisy chain, I think that's the way that we are structuring this. I believe that the people who are physically able. To, to grow for themselves are going to be the ones who are ultimately going to be providing f care for those that, that can't because with, with taking the storefronts out and the money out of this it's going to be hard to get the goodwill uh, that, w that we think that we've heard is, is there but I think it's going to be more difficult to, to realize with this structure. So can we conceptually agree to that and there's a couple other pieces of that maybe we could pick off because I know one of the issues you raised Senator Vincent is limiting the number of plants. I mean, the simplest way still to say is that you can have up to 12 seedlings and not in the whole world because some of those don't survive, I understand. The real key is the four mature plants per person. And in a group like that, you could even probably reduce it. I mean, it's five now. You could probably take it even down to three and you get rid of some more of the excess. But, but given that people require or use that at different rates and the plants mature at different rates, I would really suggest not because they're in a group trying to reduce that whole number. It's easier to just say per person they can still only have 12 seedlings, which really is the viability of your operation is having to have more seedlings than you can bring to fruition. It's the number of mature plants that's the key issue there if you're trying to grow them. So I would not try to make that a a group amount, but it's still by individual card holder. Does that make sense? I think I understand what you're saying. Rather than have 48 seedlings for the group, 
you lowering that focusing more on the mature plants on do it would be 12 mature plants that they would be able to have right i would mr chairman i would just leave the number of seedlings there's they're important as a base but they really don't count that isn't what the product is it is the mature plants that are the product and the amount of product that's available and out there so yes i would focus on the, what is the number of mature plants that need to be available to ensure an adequate supply for each individual card holder and those get sta get staggered out to some degree i mean it's sold i mean there's not a lot of reason to have three mature at one time but I see what you're saying. you see what i mean Have a, if you have a registered card holder who is a has designated someone else as his provider, they could not s serve as a provider for anyone else. That would be the second mm -hmm. sentence that we need. That would, that would limit the daisy chain. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of just putting no daisy chains in there. <laughs> <laughs> Subsection I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was my motion, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, since this is very technical and we want to be careful, let's review this. Carefully language in the, morning. in the morning. Mr. Chairman, the third issue there that I was looking at, and I think we've talked about this somewhat informally, is <clears throat> the real motivation for someone to grow this for other people without being paid for it has got to be that they are also a cardholder. Generally, that's going to be the, they're already growing it for themselves, so they would grow it for other people. But the fact that they now are registered as, an, as a grower for other people means they have to go through this process with the department, which is going to cost some money and fingerprinting, et cetera. And there are other costs related to um, the growing of that. And if they are not a cardholder themselves, if we <coughs> don't let them sell it, but asking them to become that grower without some way to reimburse them for some de minimis amount of money for expenses, we're not asking them to just do it for free. We're asking them to pay to become a caregiver for somebody else. And that just doesn't work. And that's where I think we were talking about, is there some way to person registered on this section maybe reimbursed up to $500 a year, $1,000 a year by each cardholder for whom the person cultivates or manufactures the marijuana. They've got to you know, pay for electricity and all the other things that go into the growing of this, plus they've got to pay the fee to the department for going through all these background checks. So, and I don't know what that number is. I mean, the industry people tell me a new patient costs them roughly $1,500, meh. But I think we should pick some amount if, if we're into that concept at all. And so I just throw that out on the table for discussion. Okay, members of the committee, if we look at the red bill, we're on page 10, line 14. That is in section, new section 5, dealing with provider types, requirements, limitations, provider activities. Mm -hmm. Again, page 10, line 14, which states, a person registered under this section may not accept compensation for any services or products provided to a registered card holder. Mr. Chairman, what we were discussing was not allowing people to buy or sell marijuana. And is that different from being able to reimburse somebody for, you know, minimal expenses or their uh, filing fees to get registered with the state and go through all of those background checks. Members of the committee, this is a difficult subject to deal with mm -hmm. because I think the term reasonable compensation appeared under the existing law and that contributed to 